Father, we love you. We're grateful for all that you do. Bless now, for it's in thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible says of Enoch that he was translated that he should not see death. I want you to see, first of all, as we think about Enoch this morning, I want you to see Enoch's trip, if you would. How many of you have ever gone on a trip somewhere, on a vacation? Aren't those trips always fun, always exciting? I'm not much of one. I'm not much of one for riding in a car, though. I would a lot rather fly than I would drive. Some of you are already shaking your head. You're a nut, and that you would rather fly than drive. I just don't like being in a car, you know, for a long period of time. I mean, I know flying is much more expensive than, than driving is sometimes, but, you know, those nine to ten hour days in a car, that's just a long day. And uh, my tail end can't endure that long of sitting in a car. And, you know, but I, I like going on trips from time to time and, and taking a trip. And the Bible says that Enoch had a trip. He jumps off the pages of Genesis 5 and grabs our attention it is in Genesis 5 that we record uh, the story of uh, Enoch. And I want you to look there with me in Genesis chapter number 5. And I want you to hold your place here in uh, chapter number 5 because we will be coming back here. But I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter number 5, verse number 21. It's been said that if... X, uh, that if Hebrews 11 is the whole of faith chapter, then Genesis 5 has to be the death chapter. And you'll understand that because you look through this genealogy, it talks about each individual, how long they live, and then there's always this phrase, and they die. And they die. So if Hebrews 11 is the whole of faith chapter, and recording for those, the faith that lives on after death, then Genesis 5 is the death chapter, with the exception of one individual. The individual we're talking about this morning by the name of Enoch. Look at verse number 21. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and beget Methuselah. How many of you would like to be 65 years of age and having your first kid? Of course, we understand times were different back then, you know. But we think about now, and we're thinking, uh-uh, there ain't no way that's happening. 65 years of age. The Bible says, and Enoch lived after, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch, now this is interesting, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. His trip. Enoch had one of the most spectacular trips that any person has ever gone on. Enoch, the Bible said, walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What that simply means is this, that Enoch did not experience a physical death because God took his life. Can I remind you and I today that one of these days, you and I, through faith in Jesus Christ, are headed on a trip. And we are going to be much like Enoch. If the Lord, if we see the Lord through the rapture, we're not going to see death either, then we're going to be raptured out. We're going to be translated, if you will. God's going to call us to himself, but it is only through faith that you and I can have that sort of a trip. Amen. What a trip, right on a cloud. Isn't that going to be fun? Miss Peggy's like, nope. <laughs> what a way to see the earth from the clouds going up. You know what I can promise you, though? That because Jesus is going to be there, that is going to be the safest cloud ride that we're ever going to go on. That's going to be safer than any car you've ever stepped into, safer than any bus you've ever traveled on, safer than any airplane you've ever gone on. Maybe they'll even have seatbelts for you, Miss Peggy, so that you can... Right, you're, you're, you're hoping for the chariot, okay. <laughs> Mr. Peggy wants the chariot. The trip that he goes through. What a trip. What a trip. Hasn't life been a trip? Yes. Oh, yeah. Life has been a trip, has it not? <laughs> the only way that I believe I can get through life is through faith. Amen. Amen. The only way that I can t take this trip that is known as life is through faith Amen. in Jesus Christ. I... I told some people at work the other day, 
many of you, I, we told about Tristan and having to send him to the hospital last Friday night. And, and, and if, if, if the situation of that wasn't bad enough, about 2 o'clock Saturday morning, Christian comes in there. And he wakes his mom up. Thankfully, she sleeps on the side closest to the bedroom door. I'm on the opposite side of the bed. I was snoozing good. This was the first night that I still got in bed after 11, so it didn't matter. I didn't, I didn't work late that night, but I still got in bed late. Man, I was sleeping so good about 2 o'clock this last Saturday morning. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I hear Barbie, Eddie, I think something's wrong with Stitch. Well, if you know anything, I don't know if we told you, Stitch was Tristan's cat that we had gotten him. Christian comes in there and he goes, Mom, something's wrong with Stitch. She elbows me. She goes, Eddie, I think Stitch is dead. Mm. No, he can't be. He was just fine. <laughs> Christian goes, no, he's got a heartbeat. So I go, I get up out of bed. I walk over there and I take Stitch from, trip from Christian. And sure enough, there's no heartbeat. The cat is dead. I'm like, are you kidding me? Could this go any worse? Could this day be any worse than what it's already been for our family? But you know, I told somebody at work, I said, the only way that I can get through all this and all the heartaches and all the trials and all the testings that we go through is by faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, this world, this, this life is definitely a trip, is it not? But what a trip it is when you have Jesus Christ as your partner. As you have Jesus Christ as your co-companion. As you have Jesus Christ as a source of navigation in life. Telling you how to conduct yourself. Telling you which way to go. You know, sometimes these GPS units we have, they get really annoying. <laughs> Especially when you miss your turn. Recalculating. Recalculating. I'm fixing to recalculate you right out the window <laughs> is what I'm fixing to do. But see, what a companion. What a, what a navigator when you have Jesus Christ with you. When you have faith in Jesus Christ and he navigates this trip that we're on. You know, we're going to experience what a great trip this life is at. When we come to the days and time of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, look there with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 13. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13, and this is what I'm waiting on. And I know that as God's people, this is what you're waiting on as well. But I would not have you to be ignorant, verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I like verse number 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The greatest source of comfort. I believe for the child of God is, hey, listen, you're in a trip. This life's a trip. This life is a trip that has a lot of ups and it has a lot of downs. It has a lot of hills and it has a lot of mountains. It has a lot of valleys and it has a lot of, uh, of high tops and, and low points in our, in our midst. But thanks be to God that one of these days, my Jesus, I shall see. Amen. One of my favorite songs. What a day that will be. Where my Jesus, I shall see him. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Amen. Oh, the moment that we can gaze upon the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All this life will be just a glimpse. And think, man, how God got me through. You know how he does? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. Walking with God. 
That's what Enoch did. He is the faith walker, if you will. He walked with God. We see his trick. I believe that while we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, faith is to be a key part of our waiting. We have to have faith. What does Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says? Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, to be evidence of things not seen. I haven't seen the rapture yet, but I'm hoping for it. I know it's coming. I don't know when, but I know it's coming. I believe it's getting closer each and every day. As I see the signs arrival around us, I just have to say, look up for your redemption draw if not. Amen. The Lord's coming. As John said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's my prayer this morning. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Come and call us home to be with you. But we must have faith. Look with me at Titus chapter number 2, verse number 11. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 11. The Bible says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, Titus 2, 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The evidence that we believe that Jesus is coming back soon is found in our godly living. It's found in how we live our lives. The evidence of our faith in Jesus Christ is found in how we conduct ourselves through this trip that we're on. Look with me back over at Hebrews chapter number 10, verses 5 and 6. Let me show you the second thing about Enoch today. Not only was he on a trip... But he had a testimony as well. Notice, the, notice what God's testimony of Enoch is. The Bible says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. But notice this. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Prior to the Lord calling Enoch out of this world. Before Enoch was raptured, before Enoch was translated into the heavens with God, the Bible said and God said of, a, of Enoch that he pleased God. What a testimony. What a testimony that God himself said, I was pleased in Enoch. I was pleased by the conduct of Enoch. I was pleased by the way Enoch conducted himself. Back over in Genesis chapter number 5, we read the words that Enoch walked with God. He had a walk with Jesus Christ. He had a testimony that he believed God. He had a testimony and that he pleased God. Truly, this is a wonderful testimony to have. Enoch pleased God. Let me ask you this morning, are you, is your life pleasing to God? Is our lives pleasing to God? Well, verse number 6 tells us that if there's not faith in your life, then no, your life is not pleasing to God. Because the Bible says in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. You and I will never be pleasing to God if we don't have faith in God. If we never put our faith into Jesus Christ, we cannot be pleasing to God. Enoch had the testimony that he pleased God. How did he do that? Because he had faith in God. He had faith in Jesus Christ. This is a thought I don't want you and I to take lightly. His testimony. You know, there are a lot of things in our lives that we deem as important. Many of them truly are important. Family is important, are they not? Man, our, our families are important. 
Friends are important. I think everybody ought to have a good friend in their life, one that they can confide in, one that they can talk to and just have that camaraderie with. Church is important. None of us would disagree with that, would we? The church is essential, it's crucial to the Christian life. Church is important. Jobs are important. I mean, we had to have money. Jobs are an important thing in life. Interpersonal relationships are important. Paying bills are important. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I've gone on a bad subject this morning. <laughs> I said a bad word from the pulpit. I said bills. You know, paying our bills. But it's important that we pay our bills. You don't pay your bill, what happens? You get cut off and then you don't have it. So it's important that we pay our bills. But I don't believe there's anything more important in the Christian life than being pleasing to God. Amen. I think it is the most pleasing thing to God is that we, that there's nothing more important than just simply pleasing our Savior. If we get to the end of our lives and God is not pleased, what do we have? We have nothing. If we get to the end of our lives and we stand before God and we hear the words, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. What have we given? Nothing. But if we stand before God and we heal, hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, you've pleased me in life. You've been pleasing to me. You've pleased me with the way you've conducted yourself, with the way you've carried yourself. The question could be asked, and well, preacher, how did Enoch please God? Well, according to Genesis chapter number 5, verse number 24, the simple fact of the matter is this. Enoch was pleasing to God by walking with God. I mean, that's all I have to go off of. What few verses we find in Scripture concerning Enoch is that Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. He walked with God. You know what a walk with God will do is it will be pleasing to God. God's pleased when we walk with Him. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. When we walk with the Lord. Just walking with God. Walking with Jesus Christ. Each and every step of our lives walking with God. I love that point, footprints in the sand. As I traveled down Lost Road one day, I began to look and I noticed two set, set two sets of footprints. Traveled a little further and I began to look back and only see one set of footprints. And I wondered where did the other set go? It was at that moment that I realized that Jesus was carrying me. Amen. Just walking with God. Walking hand in hand with Jesus. Walking hand in hand with our Savior. Walking hand in hand with my Savior. Our walk with God, I believe, has certain ingredients to it. I believe the first ingredient to a testimony of pleasing God and a testimony of walking with God requires that we have cooperation with God. Amos chapter 3, verse number 3 says this, Can two walk together except they be agreed? We can't walk together if we're not agreed. So how are you and I going to walk with God if we don't agree with God? There's got to be cooperation with God. We've got to agree with God. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We've got to cooperate God sets the standard. We're to live to the standard. Amen. See, as a parent, how many of you as a parent ever set standards for your kids? Set rules for your kids? Maybe it was a curfew. Maybe it was, I don't know, a chore. This is what, you do. This is what you're to do. If you don't do it, here's the consequence. Or the punishment, however you want to say it. Nowadays, it's not politically correct to say punishment anymore. We've got to say consequences. <laughs> That's almost what every doctor will tell you. Well, it's not punishment, it's consequences. My house is the punishment. <laughs> this is what you get if you don't do this. But cooperation. We need some cooperation with God. 
God says, child, do this, we're to do it. We're to cooperate. We've got to be in, in agreement with God and cooperate together. Have you ever heard this statement, two heads are better than one? Yeah. Sometimes that's true. Other times that's not so true. But you know, when you get two heads, two people together that are working on the same project, isn't it a lot easier than just one? I've never built the never built anything, but I, I know of people here in the church that have. That task of building something is always easier when you have multiple people, is it not? I mean, I have no doubt that if I was to give the blueprints to Brother Bob this morning to build me a church exactly like what we have today, and I gave him all the materials and I said, hey, build it, Brother Bob could probably do it. But you know, he's gonna, it's going to get done a lot faster if Brother Bob has some help doing it. If I'm relying on Brother Bob to do it all by himself, I might get the church built in a year. He said two. Two years. <laughs> but if I give Brother Bob the blueprints and all the material and say, hey, I need this built. I want this building built in this location, but here's you 30 guys to that know what they're doing. I just want you to oversee the project. Guess what's going to happen? That two-year project will get done in a whole lot less time because he's got some cooperation. He's got some people that know what they're doing working together. And that's the same in the church. If only one person's doing the work, guess what's going to happen? It's going to take a whole lot of time. But if every individual in the church comes together and we cooperate together underneath the instructions of God's Word, you know what we can do? We can do great things when it comes to faith in God and walking with God. It's cooperation. Secondly, I believe there should be communication with God. We're to communicate with our Savior. How many of you like to communicate? You like to talk. You better raise your hand, young man. <laughs> I know you do. I got, I'll raise both hands. I like to, I, I, you know, you ever, I, I know you've heard this about somebody, and, and maybe this has been said of you. Man, that person has the gift of gab. They talk all the time. You can't get them to be quiet. You know, you ever, you ever met that person that, you, you almost are hesitant to ask them how they're going, how they're, how they're doing, because for the next 45 minutes to an hour, you're going to hear all about how they're doing. And you almost hesitate. You ever have people like that in a church? You're just like, man, I, 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 I need to go shake hands with them. Lord, please help me to keep my mouth shut and not ask them how they're doing. And then the very first thing you do is, hey, brother, how you doing? Oh, man. <laughs> man, I ain't going to get in there for the next, you know. But communication. There's nothing wrong with communication. Sometimes we communicate. And, you know, there are times I'll, dad will call me and we'll communicate on the phone. And sometimes we may spend five or ten minutes on the phone. Then other times, it's like I get off the phone with Dad, and I think I look down, and I'm like, holy cow, I was on the phone over an hour with him, just chit-chatting and talking, communicating. And I enjoy that. I really do. I enjoy talking to people that I, I don't get to talk to as often. But you know, when we walk with someone, we need to have fellowship with those people. And I believe that God is pleased when we communicate with him. God wants to hear from us in our lives. He wants to hear how our days go. Wait a minute. You say, preacher, he already knows. Yeah, I know he knows. But maybe he just wants to hear it from us. Maybe he just wants to hear from us more than just once or twice. Or, You know, I, I think he wants to hear from us more than just at the dinner table. When we say, Lord, bless this food. Help it to nourish our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. I think he wants to really hear from us. He wants that time of communication, speaking with us. Thirdly, if we're going to please God, our testimony must be one of conduct. 
Walking with God requires certain kinds of behavior. If we're going to walk the way God wants us to walk. You know, God gives instructions to us on how to live our lives. God doesn't leave anything to chance in our lives. He doesn't say, okay, child, I saved you. Now, figure out life. He doesn't do that. He's given us a manual. He's not like the Chinese that give you a something to build, and then they give you instructions that you can't read. <laughs> figure it out. God doesn't do that. He says, hey, I've given you a manual. I've given you a textbook. I've given you something to help you in your conduct. How do we conduct ourselves? How do we walk right in, in our lives? The Bible talks about that we are to walk in newness of life. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. Bible says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, after salvation entered our lives, we got a new life. And the Bible said that we're to walk in newness of life. You know what that what that tells us? That we're not to walk the way we used to walk. We're not to walk after the old man. The things that we used to do in our lost condition aren't, shouldn't be that way. The way we used to talk when we were lost, the things we used to do when we were lost, we shouldn't do anymore. Maybe you were saved, and maybe before you got saved, you were a drunkard. And God saved you out of that. Well, you know what you should get rid of in the new life? The alcohol. Maybe you were a tobacco user when you were lost and didn't know right from wrong in that regard and God saved you. And then you could, uh, over time, you got rid of the tobacco. You got rid of the, the snuff and the cigarettes. You began to walk in newness of life. Maybe in your old life, you had a filthy mouth. We see that in our lives, do we not? I'm thankful for kids who know good words from bad words. Tristan was in the ambulance the other night. His mama was telling me, and the paramedic said a bad word that he shouldn't have. And Tristan looked up at the guy and said, you shouldn't talk like that. That's good. Amen. I'm thankful for that. Amen. I'm thankful for that. For a young man that just said, hey, you shouldn't talk like that. Them were dirty words. You know? That had been me growing up saying that. As many of y'all would have experienced, there was a bar of soap in the bathroom that would have had my name on it. <laughs> and I'd have eaten that bar of soap. And we have done that with our kids. May them eat soap. How many of you ever had to do that? Eat soap. Well, man, was there a hand went up? We, you know, we all did that. Conduct. We are to walk in the newness of life. I'm thankful for that new life in Jesus Christ that he gave me, that he gives us. The old life is crucified, and we have a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. I saw the other day, or last night when I was clocking out from work, that I guess because of COVID, the attendance policy at Walmart has been canceled for the time being. And so they, they aren't giving out a point system anymore because of, of that. And supposedly they're not allowed to fire people because they don't show up to work, which I think is the, the, the dumbest thing ever. I think if you're scheduled to be at work and you call in and you do it so many times, they should still be able to fire you. I don't care if we're in a COVID pandemic or what. But supposedly I saw a thing above the time clock saying that our attendance policy is about to start back up at the beginning of October. And I thought, well, that's good, you know, that, that, that's good that We've got that. But it said on this that basically every employee is getting a fresh start, a clean slate. So every employee starts with zero occurrences, and then we're going to build up. they got to make it fair, I guess. But you know, isn't that what God did with you and I? Is he saved you? He gave you that new life, and he said, okay, now I'm giving you a clean start. 
a fresh start, if you would. Now, here's some standards that you need to start living by. Instead of doing this, do this. Instead of acting this way, act this way. Here's your conduct. Here's the way that life is supposed to be. We're to walk in newness of life. We're to walk in the Spirit, according to Galatians 5, 16. Look there with me. Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 16. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You want to gain victory over the flesh in your life? Live after the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. Walk after the things of God. Well, preacher, what are the things of God? Well, verse number 22 tells us what the things of God are. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. You want to live like God desires you to live? Pattern your life after Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Make those qualities a quality in our lives. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Walk after the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our conduct. And then the Bible talks about walking in love. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 2. The Bible says, Where in time past ye walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now notice this, but God. I like those words, but God. Because it shows me that there's something better than the old way. There's something better for the lost person. There's something better for you and I in life, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Walk in love. Loving people. Loving individuals. Our conduct today is important to our testimony. And then I believe the fourth aspect of our testimony and the fourth ingredient that our walk with God must have is this. Our walk with God must have confidence as well. Confident in our walk with God. Confident in our ability to stand the test of time. Confidence in our ability not to be shaken. Confidence is a very important part of our walk with God. In fact, I mention it now, but the concept is developed in this verse I want to look at. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 7. Notice what the Bible says. For we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Confidence that God is going to take care of you. Confidence in God's ability to help us in our lives. For we walk by faith, not by sight. See, when I think about our lives, when I think about the trip of life that we're on, when you're in the valley, when you're in the low times of life, you're not able to see what's up on top of the mountain. You're not able to see everything there is to see. But just re let me remind you today that there's a God who you serve, who you're walking with, that's seated in heaven, higher than our problems, higher than the mountaintop. He's able to see what's on the other side. He's able to see what's going to come from it. 
We may not see it. We may not know. But we don't have to. Because faith in Jesus Christ helps us get through the trials. Amen. You ever enter into a trial and you think, I don't know what's going to happen in this trial. I'm not sure what's going to come from this. And then you get through it and you look back and you think, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know why? Because of faith in Jesus Christ. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Confidence in God's ability. Many times the disciples found themselves in a boat in a stormy situation. You know who they called out to? God, the, the keeper of the storm. Lord, save us, we perish. Lord, help us, we perish. And you know oftentimes what God's response was back to those people in that situation? O oh, ye of little faith. O oh, ye of little faith. See, they forgot about the master in the boat. They were so focused on the situations. They were so focused on the monumental things around them that they forgot about the master sitting right there with them the whole step of the way. Let me remind you that, hey, it's not the mountains that are the issue. As Brother Keenan shared with me last week with that little thing, you see it as a mountain. God sees it as a molehill. Something very small. Something very simple. Something very easy to overcome. Confidence in God's ability. See, if we walk with God, we're going to have to have confidence in Him. And then let me show you thirdly this morning. From the life of Enoch, we've seen his trip. We've seen his testimony. Let me show you his trust as well, his trust. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, notice these words, must believe that he is. That he is. That's an interesting word. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that he was or that he will be, but it says, must believe that he is. Which shows you and I the fact that God expands all time frames. God is there no matter when you find yourself in life. Whether, whether you look back a thousand years this way or a thousand years into the future, God always has been and God always will be. God is. He is the I am. He is the I am of your storm. He's the I am of your life. He is the I am, the I am, the I am. He is my I am today. He's the I am. But without faith, God, his trust was in God. He re remembered that he is. And then notice this, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You want to be rewarded? Serve God. You want to be rewarded? Live for God. Walk with God. One of these days, we're all going to stand before God. And we're going to give our works to be tried. The Bible says the works that we do for ourselves are going to burn as wood, hay, and stubble. You know what we're going to be left with? A pile of ashes of no avail. But the Bible says the works that we do for God are going to stand the fire and are going to come out jewels that we can then not keep for ourselves, I don't believe. I believe we're going to give them back to God. Lay them at the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, it's been an honor to serve you. It's been my greatest joy to live for you. It's been my greatest pleasure to serve you. But can you say that? Has walking with God been your greatest joy in life? Has walking with God been brought great, more satisfaction to you than anything else? Has walking with God been the greatest thrill in your life? 
I pray it has been. I pray it has been. Nothing's more satisfying in this life than a relationship with God. Nothing's more satisfying than having a walk with Jesus Christ. Putting trust in Him. If we don't have faith in God, it is impossible to please God. If we're going to come to God, we must believe that He exists. I mean, if I was to ask you today, do you believe that God exists? I know all of you would say yes. So if you believe that He exists, then walk with Him. Live for Him. Follow Him. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Will you follow Him today? Will you put His trust Will you put your trust in him? So how does he reward us? The Bible says that there in verse 6 that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, he rewards us through peace. He gives us peace in the valley. Peace in the troubles. Peace in the hardships. He answers our prayers. Isn't that an encouragement? That he answers prayers. Sometimes his answer may not be our answer. Sometimes we want God to say yes and God says no. But you know, I've realized in life that no is not a bad thing. No is not a bad thing. When my parents told me no growing up, I sometimes thought that, that was the end of my life. Can't believe they told me no. You know, when I asked Dad at the age of 16 if I could have a car, if, if I could drive his car, he would say, no, get out and get you one. Man, Dad, you're rude. <laughs> you know what I found out, though? He wasn't rude. He was wanting to teach me some responsibility. He was wanting to teach me how to take care of something. I can remember the first car I got. It was a Suzuki Samurai. Man, it was like a miniature Jeep. And uh, things were awesome. I found one for sale yesterday at Walmart. And a guy had it on. I wanted in. And I wanted to find out. Because, I mean, if I could, you know, that first car I had, that was the, I mean, it was the greatest car ever because it was my, I had paid for it with my own money. And I thought it was awesome. But, you know, Dad taught me some responsibility when it came to. I thought he was mean. But you know, sometimes I might look at God and think, God, you're mean for telling me no, no. God knows that that's not what I need. Yeah. He's looking out for me. He's trying to teach me some things. No is a good thing, but he answers our prayer. He gives us the Holy Spirit power in our lives. Man, that's a great thing. That we have whole, the Holy Spirit power of God living on our lives. We've got godliness. He gives us godliness. So now if we truly believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, what will he do? Well, the Bible gives us the idea. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 6. Notice what it says here. You want to, you want to, you want to get close to God. You want to have trust in Him, and He'll reward you. The Bible says, "Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near." He wants to hear from you this morning. He wants to hear from you today. He wants to hear from me today. He wants you and I to, he wants to hear from us. If we are truly going to be men and women of faith, we must be men and women who believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. If we believe that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him, we will seek him. This is what trust is all about. Do you believe this morning that he's going to reward you if you seek him? Do you believe this morning that 
He has your best interest at heart. Hey, Enoch walked with God. Enoch had a testimony that he walked with God. Let me close with this statement this morning. If God looked at us like right now, if God walked through those doors, and I invited him to stand behind this pulpit to give his assessment of our Christian walk, what would his assessment of us be? I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for myself. But if God stood right here today and began to call each and every one of us by name, and said, this is what I think of your walk, would he be pleased with it? Or would he look at us and say, well, you kind of failed me, but you need to improve. Aren't you thankful that God, even though if he looked at us and said, well, your walk's not what it should be, but he said, why don't you, he said, I want to give you another chance. I want to give you another offer I'm thankful that God gives us another opportunity to make it right. When perhaps maybe we realize, hey, my walk's not what it should be. God says, that's okay. Make it right today. Make it right, right now. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. I thank you for the example of Enoch and how he walked with God. Father, he had the testimony that he walked with God. He had a trip that we too will experience if we have faith in Jesus Christ being translated into heaven. But Father, help us in our lives to put trust into you. Proverbs 35 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Father, I pray this morning that we as your people would trust you, that we would have the walk that you desire for us to have. And Father, if there's one here today that has been convicted through the Holy Spirit and they realize that their walk isn't what it should be, then Father, I pray today that they would make that right. That Father, that our walk would be what it should be for you. Father, we love you today. We're grateful for all that you do. Bless now in this invitation time for it's in thy name we pray. Amen.